We're here to idea everyone, to fire up your curiosity and connect you with the people and ideas that shape our world. Watch, listen, understand, connect, create. Let's move the human story forward together. Hello, I'm Andrea McDonald, the founder of Idea Me. Who are you? I am Josiah Zayner and I am a scientist and lover and I like to do and see creative and beautiful things. Tell us a little bit about your story. My story, where, where do I start? Do I go like, how, how far back are we talking here? Uh, go back to your PhD and oh, okay. when you decided not to continue in academia. My PhD, wow, okay. I don't know. I, I, give me a second because it was a traumatic time in my life. So I'm going to have to like, um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's interesting how, um, uh, there a lot of people, their experience with like academic science and PhDs, if you ask them about it, they're not like, Oh, it was the best time of my life. I don't think I've ever heard anybody say that. They're like getting their PhD was the best time in their life, which is, kind of sad but um and for me you know I learned a lot I don't think I would be where I am today without a PhD from the University of Chicago um the people there are amazing scientists but also like I think it it, it the way that the learning environment is and the way that science is done in these environments is um pushing towards a very dogmatic view of science in the world. And that's just kind of not who I am as a person. I'm very iconoclastic. And so it, it just like kind of made me decide to maybe doing science in this type of environment isn't for me, right? Maybe I can do science in another environment where I'd be more happy and it would fit me and my personality better. Um, and so I left and I started working at NASA, the space agency. And you left because you um, didn't like how things work there. Yeah, it's just like. I think the way science is done right now, it it used to be that people did science to like discover things or because they were curious about things and because it's become so like commoditized, now people do science to publish papers and get grants and all these other things that have strayed so far away from the original point of just like, understanding the world around us and understanding what's going on and um even places like nasa are like that and uh it kind of to me it is sad because like science is this really fun amazing thing it's like we have as human beings one of the things that separates us from like all other animals is like our ability to um, you know, like build technology, understand the world around us, and build on top of that. And um, that's, that's pretty crazy. It's such a superpower. I think people don't even understand, right? And uh, being able to utilize that to like, do cool and fun stuff. Like, why, why aren't people doing that? So you want to spark curiosity in the biotechnology sector and invite the public in. And with that in yeah. mind, you established a, a really fascinating organization called Odin. Um, can you talk to us about that and what you yeah. think it overcomes? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, you know, around the time where I was at NASA and I realized that like science to me, the science I want to do is completely different. It's very curiosity driven and not for the, the goal of publishing or, um, you know, getting grants or things like that. 
And I wanted other people to be able to experience this stuff. So I started my company, the Open Discovery Institute, the ODIN, we call it. And um, it helps people learn how to do science and genetic engineering in their own homes. Um, because I think that in order for there to be innovation in these areas, people need to be educated and they need, they need to be free from the shackles of, you know, the academic world. Like somebody who's experimenting in their garage is probably doing it for the sake of it, you know, rather than to publish papers and get grants. So I think these people are our hope for the future of science. You've come up against um, issues with the FBI and the FDA. Can you talk to us a little bit about that? No, actually, I'm not allowed to. I'm joking. I can talk about it. <laughs> um, well, most of it, at least. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's interesting you know, and I get it. It's like when you have new technologies, a lot of times people, they don't understand them or they don't know what's going on with them. And so they get afraid, right? Um, you can see this happening a lot with AI. And I'm not saying like we shouldn't be afraid of AI or we should be afraid of AI. But like every time a new technology rolls around, we kind of all get scared and afraid and are just like, all right, how can we like, regulate this how can we stop this um instead of necessarily trying to understand it that usually comes later and i've run into that a bunch with government agencies in the u.s and in, in the whole world um where places are just like oh this you know like you're gonna cause a viral outbreak or something and you're just like how's that not even possible like our kids don't even have viruses. They don't even like teach people to work with viruses. Like, how do you expect that to happen? Or like, you know, you're going to cause, people are going to cause illness or disease or something like that. And it's like, it's not possible. Like the organisms that they work with in our kits are specifically, you know, engineered so that they're not harmful to humans. And it's just like, um, yeah, people are scared and afraid. And I get that. Um, it's just kind of sad because the level of knowledge we have of biological things, right? Like we're made of biological things and the level of knowledge we have about ourselves is so much less compared to like, you know, cell phones and computers, right? And it's just like... You've likened it a little bit to the, um, the invention of the car and, and you've said you wouldn't be opposed to similar sort of regulations in as far as stoplights um, and driver's license and licenses and so on um, to regulate uh, or quasi regulate the biotech industry. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. Yeah. You know, I think that um, I I think that there's things that we can all agree upon, you know, as much as I like to be, you know, like anarcho and kind of classic, like I, I still am like a reasonable human being most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> um, and like, I think there's stuff we can all agree upon that um, like people shouldn't really be doing in their homes, um, like working with Ebola or something, right? Like, I think we're all okay. Generally, if you're not okay with that, you know, I think you're like on the fringes of, you know, society and everything. It just makes sense, right? If like a tornado comes through and blows down your house and you're working with Ebola, even if you have like a really nice lab, like you're going to release Ebola into your neighborhood. Like that's not cool. Um, and so I think there are just certain things we can all agree on that like this doesn't infringe on people's rights but helps protect everybody from um, unintended negative consequences. Um, and I think having something like that would bring a lot more confidence in what people do. Um, 
but I think it's also like getting the government to be reasonable and move fast with any sort of technology is extremely difficult. You know, I imagine 10, 15 years from now, they're going to come out and be like, all right, here's our guidelines. For this stuff. It's like, it's already too late. Like everybody's already doing this stuff everywhere. Like, this is now. <laughs> I think a, a, a major issue is, of course, um, whilst uh, $240 billion are being spent a year on biotechnology, um, who, who's actually benefiting from this, given how expensive um, these, the resulting medications are? Uh, could you talk a little bit about that and the unfairness of, uh, well, I guess the lack of the level playing field as far as patients are concerned? Yeah, it's hard, you know, because like, um, especially when you look at, you know, drug development or even agricultural development and all these things, a lot of this stuff stems from government funded research. Um, at some level, sometimes a good chunk of it stems from government funded research. But when these things come to the real world, you know, a company then will come in and be like, oh, well, you know, we're going to do the run the clinical trial and, um, you know, bring it to market and we're going to charge whatever we want. When this whole thing from the beginning was government funded and supported, and it's coming to people where it's supposed to be helping and saving lives, um, no matter what it is in agriculture or, you know, vaccines or medicine, gene therapies. Um, and then people get charged uh, sometimes millions of dollars for this, you know. Or people don't get access to this because you know government regulations don't allow it it takes too long or just um yeah it's a it's a really complicated and difficult landscape i think because there's so much power but at the same time governments are so afraid of people getting hurt unintended and um that makes it so that we're still where the technology is, biotech is like here. It's like 20 years in the future to where we're currently um, experiencing in our lives. And that's just like sad, that's sad. And yeah, so it's just like, how can we create a better environment for innovation and to help the government allow these things to bring benefit to all of us. Because right now it's like, you know, very few gene therapies get approved. And uh, when they do, they're millions of dollars. Very few crops and things like that get approved that can be very helpful to the world. And it's just, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of sad right now. Um, I was really interested to read um, recently that over 400 million people are affected by rare disease, uh, which seems in, in a sense a contradiction in terms, um, yeah, assuming, <laughs> assuming that it, there's even less investment in that area because it's rare, supposedly rare. Um, you are um, a big advocate of allowing people who um, have these diseases or have been told uh, effectively there is no hope for them to be allowed um, to take a risk. Themselves yeah, for on sure. Their own body. Well, it's just because, like, you know. I think one of the hard things to realize is and most of us don't experience this is that like the government's not going to save us. The medical industry is not going to save us. Um, if they've already created a medicine for a disease or illness, we have sure it's available to us, but nobody's there who's, who's going to save us when we're sick with an illness, especially one that doesn't already have treatment. You're just, you're out of luck, literally. Like there's no treatment, 
there's nothing they can do. Usually they just tell you like, you know, you're going to die and here's what we can do to like help you get for the, for the last months of your life or whatever. And it's really sad because I've, I've had a lot of people reach out to me who are in this position. Look, you know, the medical doctors, the government, everybody says there's nothing they can do for me. Like, is there anything I can do for myself? People come to me with this question all the time. And it's really hard because it's like, I'm like not, I'm one individual. I'm not a medical doctor. I'm not somebody who has like, can give people medical care. It's just the system set up to not help people who are, who don't have major diseases and illnesses. Why is that? I mean, the sad truth is a lot of times it's money, you know, it's just like, if a drug company can't make money off of it, they have little to no incentive to develop a drug for it. And, um, these two systems are fighting against each other and it's tough because like drug companies aren't incentivized in any way in a capitalistic society to make drugs for people with rare diseases, you know? It's not going to make them billions of dollars a year. Their shareholders aren't going to be happy, right? Like they're not increasing their revenue. As much as we want to believe people operate out of the goodness of their heart, like they don't. And um, it leaves a, a very sad place in our society, you know, and I think it's something that we need to think harder on how to fix. In February this year, a baby who has MLD was the first to uh, receive um, this um, special genetically engineered drug. Um, the, the cost um, was apparently 2.8 million pounds. Apparently the NHS, the, 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 British equivalent of the, you know, a, a government yeah, health yeah. system um, negotiated them down a little. Um, but nonetheless, it really is quite unattainable, isn't it, for parents of these? Um, yeah, because parents. here's the problem is like, people don't understand that like, with these drugs, um, even though countries have access to stuff like this and it's not all countries right even if you have a socialized healthcare system a lot of countries can't afford to pay it you know haven't negotiated the the rights to use the drug in their company and so what ends up happening is that like you know uh these gene therapies you look at like the dosing and like 90% of them are dosed to babies in the U S or something. Right. And you're just like, and it's, they're, they're not even dosing enough babies to cover the number of babies that are born with the illnesses, much less all the children who have it per year. And then you're talking about the rest of the world, you know, there's some given in the UK and, you know, maybe Australia or other places like that, but the number doesn't even meet the number of babies who are born with it every year. And so we're constantly at this deficit of like, these drug companies are charging ridiculous amounts, you know, forcing countries and insurance companies and, you know, citizens to make a decision between people's lives and whether they can afford to you know, cover the cost for all their citizens. And um, it's, it's not ideal. We have such a disregard for human life and such a regard for money. Um, and so blatantly, it, um, it scares me. It makes me sad and angry because it's just like, they're literally putting a dollar value on somebody's child's life. And that's just like, that's, um, yeah. If I can take you back to the world of adults and um, you and um, mm -hmm. your 
the different ways in which you have and are biohacking yourself. Could you talk to us a little bit about that? <laughs> Some of which are very controversial. In my life, um, I follow, um, I'm very curious. And obviously one of the things I'm most curious about is um, ourselves, myself, but like human beings in general. I think we all are. Um, when it comes down to it at the core of us, like our lives are really just trying to understand ourselves and, you know, the people around us. And um, I think that's really cool. And so with science, I'm really trying to explore that deeper than anybody else has by doing experiments on myself and um the experiments i do i generally try to make sure they're scientific and rigorous and i collect data and um analyze the data and present the data to the world usually when i do these experiments i record as much as possible or live stream the whole process the data collection the experimentation everything um, because I'm trying to instigate people to develop an intuition for scientific rigor. So when they see a video online or something and, and somebody just claims, look, I like genetically modified myself to, you know, do this thing. They'll look at it with some amount of rigor. Well, I've seen before, you know, somebody work on this and this, they measured this and this and this, this person doesn't seem to measure those things. So maybe this claim is like a little, you know, not as legitimate as this person is pretending to be. Um, and I think that's one of the ways that we can make science more, um, accessible is by being completely transparent with it. You know, and there's such a lack of transparency in science and medicine. It, it's kind of sad because this is how you win people's trust. You know, there's going to be a lot less conspiracy theorists if you have, you know, you know, live stream videos and processes of clinical trials or something and all, all these things. Like, I know there's certain levels of stuff you can't do, but like, what about radical transparency? That's going to, you know, uh, stop a lot of the conspiracy theorists um not like banning them on social media platforms <laughs> it's gonna make them go someplace else um and so i started initially with understanding how does one go about genetically modifying themselves right like if an adult human being wanted to genetically modify themselves how would they go about doing this? And so I spent um, a bunch of time. Um, this was, a, you know, a few years ago, I spent a bunch of time in my garage, just like experimenting on myself, on my skin and um, trying to see if I could get DNA inside my human cells and get that DNA to function in some way. And, um, I started off with like jellyfish DNA. There's this common jellyfish protein that scientists use called green fluorescent protein, GFP. And I was trying to put that into my skin cells. And um, it was such an interesting process because you, you can't just like type in the internet, like, all right, how does one like genetically modify themselves? There's no like step-by-step -step guide out there. I mean, now there probably is for me, but you know, other there wasn't at the time. So it's just like, all right, how would I go about trying to get DNA into my skin cells? Like the only way to really figure it out is to try, right? Um, and so I tried and- Excuse me, what, what was your objective in trying that? Just to see what would happen or was, was, was there an objective? Yeah, the objective was to like, eventually, 
I want to live in a world where human beings could modify themselves how they see fit to change their body in ways that, you know, because like we're born and this is who we are, you know, maybe for you or me, you know, some people are just like, oh, I, there's nothing I would change about myself, um, which I think is like, mm, I don't know if I believe that. Um, <laughs> But uh, we all change parts yeah. of ourselves, don't we, physically? Yeah, for sure. You know, like, and we all, I feel like a lot of people want to change, or given the option, they would change things about myself. Um, you know, like me being transgender, I think that's like a really good example of just like such an, it's it's really obvious and in your face, but it's like, there are so many other things I think that, you know, people would do. Look at right now, people, um, you know, there's this in, in the U.S., if, it, if it's going on everywhere, there's this epidemic of people taking, taking Ozempic, which is like a um, kind of like weight loss drug or a bunch of these people who are healthy are taking it like off label um, to like, lose weight and like stay fit and all this stuff right so it's like you can't tell me that people care about changing themselves it's just not everybody just doesn't want you know to like grow boobs and stuff some people want to just grow a six-pack right and i wanted to usher in i do still want to usher in this renaissance of human beings being able to change themselves how they see fit you know right now we can't you're just stuck with the genetics you have whether it's you know a genetic disease or illness or just you don't like the body you were born in um we should i think give ourselves the power and the ability to change that and by experimenting on myself and understanding how human genetic engineering works how I can make it accessible and available to people um, would be one of the things that drive this future here. Yeah, so I did that experiment and, you know, um, I could detect the um, genes functioning in my cells. And it was really, it was really cool and exciting. It was the first time I think anybody outside of a clinical trial had ever genetically modified themselves. Um, you know, the first time somebody put foreign DNA from a different organism inside, uh, you know, a different animal inside their human cells. And um, yeah, I think it was for me just like pretty profound, like, this isn't impossible. Like human beings can actually genetically engineer themselves in their garage. Um, there's a fantastic documentary called Unnatural Selection. It's a documentary series. And in that series, um, they document um, your, in, you inject, in, injecting yourself with CRISPR and, um, what that seemed to trigger um, amongst the biohacking world. Um, I say seemed to trigger. I was just interested in, in hearing your opinion on that. Yeah, it was interesting. When I started doing these experiments, my goal was more like documentation and create resources for people um, who are interested in this technology. Um, I didn't realize like how, how quickly people would try to take it and, you know, do something themselves because at this time the field of, you know, like genetic biohackers was, um, still pretty nascent and like, wasn't really large my audience in general wasn't very large. Like people weren't paying attention to me or like, you know, following me on social media really or anything like that. Um, and uh, 
when there was all of a sudden after I started working on these experiments, um, other people started, you know, following, doing similar things to what I was doing. Um, it was a little crazy. It was a little scary. Um, it was really a uh, reality check for me, understanding that, like, we don't control technology. Um, we just kind of respond to it. Because, like, once knowledge and information is out in the world, people are going to do what people are going to do with it, right? Um, generally, it's not harmful, you know? I think the majority of people have good intentions. Um, but just to see people take stuff and like, um, yeah, just like, you know, take it down their own path and their own motivations behind it. Um, it's a little scary. Yeah. A little scary for me, but, um, and I imagine that's how other people feel when they see me is um, they feel a little scared because they're like, we can't control this person. We don't know what they're going to do. Um, and uh, I get it. It's hard when you're not in control. Um, but I think like that's necessary for things to move forward and progress and for us all to benefit from technology like this, you know, there's going to be that scary part in the beginning where we're just like, Oh, what's going to happen? You know, um, that nervous anxiety, like before you go on stage or something. Um, but I think in the end, it's going to be really beautiful because that to me, human beings are just like, like, sure. There's, people who are negative and harmful and angry and mean, but I think 99.9% .9 of humans have a really good heart um, or are at least like pretending to. And um, I think that means that like, usually these technologies really help benefiting us all because people aren't trying to like create an AI to destroy the world. No, they're trying to create like AIs to benefit the world. And I think it's the same with biotechnology, right? And I think um, we have to put trust in others a little bit. Well, there are a couple of guys I'd like uh, to talk to you about. One of which is um, uh, Dr. Kevin Esfelt, yeah. um, who was featured in the documentary series and his yeah. work on uh, gene drives. I notice in the ideas section of your website, you're also interested in uh, eventually <laughs> possibly <laughs> working on a, a gene drive in the future. Can you talk a little bit about gene drives and how? Um, that's funny. Oh gosh, that's funny that you caught on to that. Um, it's of interesting. I'm yeah. Well, the I mean, idea I think... section because it's idea me. So I went straight for that. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's interesting because like, I think my goal is to, in life, is generally um, to take stuff that people want to own and possess and control and set it free, um, sometimes to the benefit of humanity and maybe sometimes to the, to like the, you know, uproar and clamor of humanity. Um, but I think um, my goal in the end is just to kind of like devalue this idea that science can only be done by a few people or, you know, people like Kevin, no offense to Kevin. I mean, we're not friends, we're probably like frenemies. But, um, uh, you know, these people want to own technology and be like, we're the only ones who can use this technology or use it ethically or morally or something like that. And it's like, wait, what? A fascist would say, you know, like, don't worry, trust me. I'm the only one who can ethically decide how to use this correctly. It's like, wait a second. 
what gives you the right and the power for this? And but so you know, to me... Sorry to interrupt you. Do you know what I did find fascinating is the area um, of your work where you both have similarities. You, you both believe that it is absolutely imperative to work with the community. Yeah, for sure. In their position, it's not like... And I get it and I understand it, but in, in a position that like Kevin's in, Kevin is like, hey, look, I have this and I'm asking you whether I can use this or not, right? Which I think an, always initially an outsider coming in and just being like, hey, I want to help you comes off as a bit of, um, you know, it, it, it comes off like somebody who is, knows better, right? This wasn't like developed by the community for the community, which I think if somebody from the community came to the community and said, Hey, look, I developed this. I I'm invested in this community because I've lived here. I've been part of this community. You all know me, right? The reception of these ideas to the community is going to be so much greater and, and better because like, it's not somebody trying to uh, invade the community and, you know, impose something on it. Instead, it's, it, it comes from pure motives of like, me trying to benefit my community myself i'm trying to benefit myself because i am part of this community and um that's what i think biohacking and science education does it starts to take science away from like something that we utilize and it becomes something that is part of our communities right it's something that we are connected to and um i think that's the differences between our approaches is like my approach is like let the community build it or make them stake owners in the building of this and and less like you know understand this or you're kind of dumb and not, not saying Kevin says this, but you know, like... For the benefit I, of people who have not come across gene drives, could you explain what they are and give a couple of examples? Yeah, gene drives are this mechanism that scientists are trying to create where um, you expose a population to a gene that uh, provides some sort of evolutionary advantage to the organism. And so it spreads rapidly through a population, right? Um, and um, this can be both positive and negative. Mostly scientists want to use it in a negative way to wipe out invasive species or um, wipe out traits that cause disease in um, animals. Um, and the big one that people work on is generally mosquitoes, trying to engineer mosquitoes that um, don't reproduce. Um, and because, you know, mosquitoes are actually very deadly in some parts of the world. They cause a lot, many, many deaths because of malaria. Um, a lot, you know, in the developed world, we usually don't have these issues, but like a lot of countries do. Um, other things are just like, you know, I think people want to work with rats and other stuff. And so it's just like, um, a large variety of organisms. People are worried though, that like, if gene drives work as, you know, they say they work, you imagine that like this, these genes could rapidly spread through populations in general. Um, like, you know, if you're trying to sterilize all mosquitoes, who's to say that, like, one of these genetically engineered mosquitoes doesn't pass the gene drive to wild mosquitoes, and then all of a sudden all mosquitoes in the world are wiped out? Not that anybody would really complain, but, you know, um, 
I noticed that um, they've also been um, working on Lyme's disease and uh, eradicating ticks from um, certain parts of America. Yeah, I mean, I think the problem is, is that like, they've learned that gene drives don't work like they theoretically expected. In the real world, it's a lot more complicated than in a lab. And so actualizing and testing gene drives that work in the real world ha hasn't really happened. Um, so it's like less something I think we should be worried about right now, um, maybe in the future. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, having this, having communities that are our stakeholders in our science is, is really important. Um, because I think then we can make more informed decisions about the science and how it's utilized in our communities. So what's happening next? What's happening next? That's a good question. You know, um, I think right now what, what I really care about is how do we increase the scale? How do I increase the scale of what I'm doing, right? Um, when we're talking about making genetic engineering technology, science, medicine, more accessible and available to people, bringing about this future that I want and I think a lot of other people would be excited about. Um, how do I do that on a bigger scale? And that's what I'm really trying to figure out right now. Um, because, uh, I think that the world is ready for a lot of these things. You know, I think people are becoming less trusting of governments and institutional bodies and do want um, the ability to protect themselves and, you know, take care of themselves and their loved ones. And um, I think that's really important. You know, I think uh, that's the minimum we should be able to have, right? Is like, can I take care of myself if I'm, if me or my loved one is hurting or in pain or sick? Like, um, I think that we all should have that opportunity. So how do people learn more, find out more about you and your work? How do they connect with you? Yeah, um, I'm on like every social media platform, you know, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. I run the Odin, which is a genetic engineering company where we sell kits for everybody to teach people how to do genetic engineering at home and we ship all over the world. Um, really cool kit we just released was a plant genetic engineering kit, which was super fun. I think it's one of my favorites. You know, it, it allows you to genetically engineer a plant in your home. Like that's really exciting. Um, so yeah, check out the-odin.com or find me on social media. Dr. Joe Zayner, thank you very much for your time. It's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Yeah, thanks for having me on. It was good. Definitely brought up some interesting questions and things, you know, that made me think a little bit. Thank you very much for being with us for this episode of the Idea Me Show. Idea Me is a global platform. Our mission is to move the human story forward by sharing knowledge of the future. You can find us on all major audio networks at www.radioideame.com, on YouTube and Vimeo. Please subscribe.